Hello everyone! Welcome back to yet another AP FRQ answer video, and this time it's going to be for chemistry. I'm going to be going over all the answers to the 2022 AP Chemistry Free Response section, as well as score predictions and a couple of tips while scores are going to be releasing. I know this test was literally so long ago, so you might not remember any of the answers, but I think it's good to kind of prime your brain because scores are coming out July 5th. So in honor of post-AP season, why not do an answer video, right? The PDF of these questions will be in the link in the description box below, or you can type the link that's in your video into your search bar. And just a quick reminder that this is not affiliated with the College Board in any way, shape, or form. I just want to go over some answers and overall just get hyped for July 5th. You know it. Okay, so this is going to be going over question one of the AP Chemistry exam, starting off with 1A. This is a pretty simple stoichiometry problem that anyone with a basic understanding of chemistry can do. But hey, I mean, if it's an easy point, then I'll take it. So you just want to use some stoichiometry, starting off with the 0.3 grams of methyl salicylate given. Then place the 152.15 grams per one mole on the bottom. And yeah, the one mole of the salicylate on top. Then for every one mole of salicylate, it's going to be one mole of the salicylic acid. And I know this because in the problem, it says that one mole of salicylate reacts with one, the one mole of a salicylic acid. That's definitely a tongue twister. So I'm going to place the one mole of the salicylic acid on top. Okay, and then for every, okay, and then after that, for every one mole of a salicylic acid, it has 138.12 grams, and that's actually what you're trying to find. So plug that in your calculator, and you get 0 0.272 grams. Okay, so that was pretty simple for question 1A. Next up for 1B, we have the salicylic acid crystal, crystals, and then we're given a bunch of properties. You can kind of hint of what the next couple problems are going to look like. This first problem is basically asking if an 87% yield is possible even after you rinse it with water. And if you look at the table, the solubility of the crystal in water is 2.2 grams per liter. It may not seem like much, but there's definitely an, am an amount of that crystal that will dissolve. So is an 87% yield reasonable instead of a 100% yield after rinsing it with water? Well, because the table does show that the solubility value does dissolve a considerable amount, then... The answer is yes, the claim is consistent because since salicylic acid does dissolve in water at least a little bit, it can dissolve when rinsing and therefore will yield a lower percent of crystal. Okay, and then for the next question, we're given all this information and we're asked to find the quantity of heat to bring it to 159 degrees Celsius and to melt the crystal completely. We're given mass, initial and final temperature, and from the table, we're also given specific heat. If you haven't guessed already, this is starting to look like a CM delta T problem. Nice, we love those. I mean, from here, it's pretty self-explanatory. We're substituting the 1.17 joules per grams times degree C for the, into the degree C for the specific heat capacity. The mass or M is going to be the 0.105 grams. And the change in temperature is T final minus T initial, so 150 degrees Celsius minus the 25 degrees Celsius. And you get an answer of 16.5 joules. But wait, this is where AP College Board likes to trick you. This is the amount of heat required to bring the crystal to 159 degrees C. But in the problem, it says to not only bring it to 159 degrees C, but to also melt the crystal completely. Okay, so we have the 16.5 joules from the last problem. Looking back at the table, we have a heat of fusion of 27.1 kilojoules per mole. Recall that the heat of fusion is the amount of heat to change one gram of solid to liquid, which is basically melting. Now, we also have to add in the heat of fusion, which is going to be the 27.1 kilojoules per mole. Now, we need to somehow add these together, but first we need to make sure that we're working with the same units. We can actually use the 0.105 grams of salicylic acid crystal and multiply it by the 27.1 kilojoules per mole. And we know that for every one mole, it actually contains 138.12 grams. So I can place that on the bottom. And then we can place the 27.1 kilojoules on top. Grams will cancel out and you get 0 0.0206 kilojoules. But we're not done yet. We need to change it to joules to match the 16.5. So take the 0 0.0206 kilojoules and multiply it by 1,000 because there are 1,000 joules in a kilojoule. 
and you get 20.6 joules. Now finally you can add the 16.5 joules and the 20.6 joules together to get a final yield of 37.1 joules. This is the amount of heat required to bring it to 159 degrees C and to melt the crystal completely. All right, next question, we're given the same salicyl sal salicylic acid and the salicylate acid, and this time it's as a structure. This is giving me huge flashbacks to organic chemistry. So for question 1D, it straight up tells us that London dispersion, dipole-dipole, and hydrogen bonding are present in the two compounds. But the melting point of salicylic acid is higher than the salicylate acid. Salicylate. This means that salicylic acid is stronger than salicylate, and then we have to use intermolecular forces to explain this. So, of course, the salicylic acid and the salicylate both have all three IMF forces. And out of all of these forces, hydrogen bonding is the strongest. Looking at these structures, salicylate has one hydrogen bond, and a hydrogen bond is when a hydrogen atom is bonded with fluorine, nitrogen, or oxygen. But the salicylic acid has one, two places of hydrogen bonding. So out of all these forces, hydrogen bonding is the strongest ion of force, like we mentioned before. And because salicylic has more hydrogen bonds, that means that it will take more heat to break the bonds. And so the sal salicylic acid melting point will be higher than the salicylate due to the discrepancy of the number of hydrogen bonds. Okay, for question 1e, we're given at a titration curve with a 0.0200 molar sodium hydroxide as, as the titrant, and we're titrating with 20 milliliters of a 0 0.0100 molar of the salicylic acid solution. When I saw this question on the test, you guys, I honestly thought it was a trick question. It simply asks for the pKa. Well, we know that the pKa is equal to the negative log of Ka, and so we need to find Ka. And because it's not given, we must refer to the graph. So looking back on the graph, the equivalence point is right here, right when the graph changes concavity. The half equivalence point will be halfway to the, to the equivalence point. That is going to be about right here. That is when the pH equals the pKa. So the half equivalence point, point is when pH equals pKa. So the pH at the half equivalence point is 3.2, which also equals the pKa, so it's going to be around a 3.2, 3.1-ish answer. And if you get around a 3.1 to a 3.3 as your answer, then I'm sure you'll be given the point. Maybe even like a 3.0 will still be accepted. I'm not really sure, but it should be pretty close to that answer. And then for question 1f, it's asking when the solution has a pH of 4, whether the acid or conjugate base is more dominant in the solution. Okay, so just putting down some information, the salicylic acid is the acid, and then the other one is the conjugate base. So if we look at the graph, we already have all the information on there, and the question asks us the, con asks the concentration of acid and conjugate base at a pH of 4, which is about right at that light blue dot on the graph. This is when the concentration of acid will be less than the conjugate base. Because we're adding NaOH, the titrant, into the solution, it's going to, which and also NaOH is a strong base, it's going to consume more of the acid, meaning that there's a lot of the conjugate base left behind. Or you might have just memorized that past the halfway point, the concentration of acid is less than the conjugate base. Either way, you do get the correct answer. So um, also because the pH is increasing, the conjugate base must also be increasing because um, it's going to be start getting above 7. So as a final answer, there's more of the conjugate base because a pH of 4 is past the halfway point. So more of the NOH, the strong base, reacts with the weak acid, leaving only the conjugate base behind as the reaction proceeds. And finally, we're on to our last question. We're given that benzoic acid is similar to salicylic acid, and we're also given the Ka value on that. Now we need to find the value of pKa for the benzoic acid. Again, this one is a super easy question just because it only revolves around an equation. By definition, pKa is equal to the negative log of Ka, and our Ka value for benzoic acid is 6.3 times 10 to the negative 5. And if you plug that into your calculator, you get a pKa value of 4.2.
not too bad of a question and uh yeah that pretty much wraps up all of the 2022 ap chemistry FRQ number one and next up, these are going to my score predictions for the test this year. Um, again, these aren't the official AP College Board scores. This is just kind of my prediction based on um, what I remember on the test. And I was surprised that to see that the AP Chemistry FRQ questions this year were surprisingly easy. Like, I tried to do a lot of practice with harder ones, only to have some easy points on the FRQ, which, I mean, I'm not complaining about, but it was definitely a surprise. However, I do have to say that the multiple choice for the AP Chemistry test was a bit harder than the previous ones I've taken, so it might like balance out somehow. So to get a 3 or to pass, I'm thinking that assuming you get about half correct on the multiple choice and maybe like 30 wrong, then you'll get a 3. The curve might be a little harder this year because of the easier FRQs, but hopefully it will be balanced by the slightly harder MCQ. And to pass with a 4 or a 5, I think if you get a 50% correct on the multiple choice and about 12 or so wrong on the FRQ, you should be good for a 4, and anything better, of course, will get you a 5. Speaking of scores, I'm definitely excited to see what the score curve is going to be. Here were the past score statistics for the AB Chem test in 2021, and as you can tell, about half passed and the other half failed, so that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. And just some extra information that about a week or two before the AP test, before AP test scores come out, um, Trevor Packer on Twitter releases these statistics ahead of time, you know, just to add that extra suspension and all that. He puts out statistics to either make you feel really good or really bad those couple days before test scores come out, which is absolutely amazing. We love that. And he even mentions how many students got perfect scores on their test, which is definitely an impressive merit. He also states what units were solid amongst all the AP Chem students. Last year, on, it was Unit 4, all about chemical reactions, and then Unit 5, which is all about kinetics, having around 15% of the AP Chem students getting perfect scores, which is awesome. So yeah, make sure to check out his account for some more updates and also make sure to subscribe to my channel give this video a huge thumbs up and most importantly i want to say thank you for watching my videos it means the entire world to be able to share my knowledge and thoughts on stuff that i love the most i'll also be posting the next two ap chemistry frqs this coming week and then some bc calc frqs as well maybe ab calc not really sure um, and then I'll also have a couple special videos on ACT tips and even a video on how to do research as a high schooler. And I'm really excited on that. So yeah, thank you guys so much and I'll see you in my next video.